Good evening, Edinburgh. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Edinburgh Book Festival, for this wonderful opportunity. We had four, this is the fourth event uh, dedicated to the theme of reviving democracy. And what a way to end it with a theme about reviving socialism with Jeremy Corbyn. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the oligarchy would rather imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. But we must be able to dream of a post-capitalist world as a prerequisite to making a democratic, a properly democratic future possible. Uh, to humanize politics. Speaking of humanizing politics, Jeremy has already made significant contributions to humanizing British politics. And I shall mention just two before we start the conversation. Firstly, he proved that it is entirely possible through dignity and a steadfast commitment to sincere politics to sidestep the systematic character assassination attempts of the systemic media. And secondly, he proved that the youth in this country and in every country are not structurally apolitical or apathetic. All they need is to see politicians that are sincere and that they get reinvigorated, they return to the political arena and they reinvigorate politics in the same way that they've done here with Momentum, with the Labour Party and indeed with the last general election where the Labour Party, against the prognosis of the establishment, had its best results since 1945 because of the young people. So, Jeremy, you. my appreciation as a non-UK person, uh, <laughs> represent, representing uh, a people that have been downtrodden and who have been crushed by the same oligarchy, which is attempting to put a pressure on you to do a Ramsey McDonald even before you get into government. But they are not going to get their way. I have no doubt about that. Uh, even though the pressures must be extreme, we, my wife and I, have experienced them severally. But how are you bearing up? Because a lot of people are asking me to ask you that question. Well, I'm absolutely fine, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone from the Daily Mail is here, you can free to, feel free to report that. <laughs> Listen. Yeah, there are pressures, of course, and um, there are abusive remarks and so on made in lots of places. But I'll tell you what real pressure is. Real pressure is when you can't feed your children. Real pressure is when you're about to lose your home. Real pressure is when you're working in a hospital, you're understaffed, and you've got to make a choice between who's the greatest emergency of a number of very important cases in front of you. And so. Um, Political representatives have to absorb a lot of pressure, but you've got to recognize the real-life pressure that lots of people are under day in, day out, in a system that is grotesquely unfair, in a society that is deeply divided between the very richest and the very poorest. And surely our message has to be, we cannot afford all these levels of inequality in Britain. We've got to do something about it. And that's the message that we've tried to put, and I put in the general election. <clears throat> You just reminded me of um, similar situations in Greece. I was being asked, how, how can you bear being the finance minister of a bankrupt country? You were just on the phone to John McDonnell a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there is a fundamental... Britain is not Greece. Mm. And that is a good thing for you and for the Labour Party. Uh, because you have a chance to win the government and with the fact given that you still have a central bank and you have a degree of independence and autonomy, a degree. Yeah. No one is autonomous in globalized, financialized capitalism. But you have an opportunity to do things that we couldn't do. But I remember people asking me about how I was bearing up. And I remembered two days before the general election, which won, we won, a Spanish journalist came to our home to interview me with a Greek interpreter. And at the end, the Greek interpreter wanted to talk to me in person. And he confessed to me that he had lost his home, he had lost his family, that he was, un he was generally unemployed and homeless. And he, he grabbed me by the hand and he said, 
look, there's nothing I want for myself because I'm finished. But please, if you win government, can you do something about those who are on the precipice and who have not fallen yet? You just reminded me by saying this. But shall we talk about socialism? Yes. Because it's a very good idea. If Bernie Sanders can turn the good people of Wisconsin into socialists and win the primary election in Wisconsin, I think that we have a duty to return to the scene of our collective left-wing crime that has led socialism to become an impolite word. We need to revive it. It is about um, presenting things in a human way and with a human value. It's not about economic and political management. It's about what you're trying to achieve. And that is something that involves and excites people. And it's about unleashing that sense of involvement and creativity that's there in all of us. You mentioned about young people and their non-involvement um, in politics in Britain. True. And uh, in the elections before 2017, the uh, participation of those younger people who had registered to vote was less than 50%, whereas the turnout for the rest of the population was a lot higher than that. And um, what happened in 2017 was a lot of young people registered to vote for the first time and indeed voted for the first time because they saw in the policies we were putting forward some sense of hope for themselves. Because they had been told ever since austerity, indeed before that, because the neocon agenda began in the 70s, it wasn't a recent thing, um, they'd been told that they should expect to be worse off than their parents and their children should expect to be worse off than them, that they would have less health care, less pensions, and they'd have to pay for their education. And what we're saying, that um, education should be a right, not a privilege, not a commodity, that health should be a right, not a privilege, not a commodity, and that um, everyone in society matters. And so that means looking quite strongly at the education system, which has become, in my view, over-competitive. In the case of the English education system, obsessed with um, league tables and tick box results, which puts incredible pressure on students and on, and on teachers, and also results in quite a lot of young people being almost failed by the education system and dropping out um, of um, academic study uh, of any sort. And so what we're saying is that young people actually matter. Now, it's not just in Britain. Britain isn't unique in that sense. The movement uh, surrounding Bernie Sanders and his campaign in the Democratic primaries in the United States. I mean, who would have thought that um, somebody calling themselves a socialist would get within a whisper of uh, whisker rather of winning the democratic um, nomination right. for the presidency, and um, it'll be the question we'll all be asking ourselves forevermore: Had it been an election between Sanders and Trump, what would the result have been? Sanders I know which one I want. Sanders would have won. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, okay. The ten years ago, mm. the young were lured by this fantasy, this dangerous illusion that modern technology on its own, you know, Google and Facebook, would create a better society. I find, do you also find the same, that today they realize that these technologies, however wondrous they may be, they are increasingly monopolized by planning systems like Facebook and Google that concentrate financialized capital and in the end turn them into products. At the same time, you have artificial intelligence. And for the first time, young people understand socialism almost instinctively because they can see that the robots that are going to be producing all those gadgets will have absolutely no need for those gadgets. They will not have any interest, any desire in purchasing them or any capacity to purchase them. So this concentration of capital, which is in increasing exponentially, means that capitalism is simply going to produce uberized labor markets, and just comprehensive misery for the very many. Do you, do you find this? To a point, yes. You can't ignore the incredible achievements of high the high-tech world. Mm -hmm. You can't ignore it. I mean, somebody 
let me try on one of these uh, face things you put on and it get, puts you into a virtual reality world and you can travel anywhere you like. And so it was Saturday night, so I thought, well, I go, I go, to, I go to Rio, I go to South Africa, I go to Mexico, I'll come home again. And it was fun, you know, press, oh, wow, that's South Africa. And it was incredibly realistic what you were looking at uh, within this thing, but it was a complete illusion, a total, a total fantasy world. Um, but then the appliance, apl application of this high tech means that we can achieve far more, you can do far more, you can do far more in medicine and everything else. But, and this is the big but, which you're quite right to draw attention to, the effect has actually been to concentrate power and the agenda in the hands of a small number of very, very powerful companies and actually make a small number of people incredibly rich at the expense of the rest. Technology ought to be something that benefits all of us in the spreading of wealth. This technological revolution so far has not. And, and it so is it is a question about the living standards of people right. and um, what you can achieve with that technology. But it's also the cultural impact because Marx talked about alienation of the proletarian, which effectively meant that the worker felt completely alienated from the products of his or her labor. Mm. But now you get alienated from the uh, products of your consumption as well. Because mm -hmm. you know, wh when two people get together in social media, there's always a, co a corporation somewhere trying to manipulate their behavior in the interests of the corporation. Uh, so the, the technology is fantastic. I, I, I can't live with, without my smartphone. I'm a, I'm a techie. I'm a science fiction buff. I have to confess to this. I want to live in communism. And for me, the ideal communism is Star Trek because you have machines doing all the work and people have philosophical discussions and they explore the universe. <laughs> but I fear that capitalism is leading us towards the matrix. Who grows the f <laughs> but, but who grows the food? The, the, uh, who wrote the food? Who grows the food? Nobody. It comes out of replicators. No, but look. <laughs> Star Trek. He hasn't watched Star Trek. No, I, I, I'm just asking the question. That you're sitting in this high-tech, wonderful world. We're watching screens. Dot, 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 dot. Everything's happening. Who's growing the tomatoes? No one. So who, uh, what do you eat? They are, they are produced through fantastic technology that can simulate the best organic food ever. It won't be impossible to no, it's, uh, no, you, uh, I ask you that question because you're quite right. I was in a <laughs> college last week where they've got... And then uh, you can grow your own food as a... Hobby, you can have an allotment. <laughs> That's a good idea. Well, that's a really good idea. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Well, I, last week I was in a college where they had something called the hands free hectare. They produced a hectare of yes. barley, and nobody has been on that field for two years. There you are. The crop is done completely by machine, and drones checking on what's going on. And the operator sends the combine harvester up and down, stops it when necessary, and it stops automatically if a rabbit runs in front of it. So it's protecting wildlife. I want to touch upon something you said before about the culture of measurement in our schools, in our hospitals. You will recall, uh, I lived through that in the early 80s under Thatcher in this country, how that happened. Do you remember how that happened? It was when Keith Joseph and the gurus, the Hayekian gurus of Margaret Thatcher, tried to effectively uh, abdicate from having any responsibility for education, for health, and so on, by simulating a market mechanism and implanting it into institutions that could never be consistent and compatible with, with markets, like yeah. the prisons, the court system, uh, the NHS, universities. And I remember how the quality of university education in this country just went down the drain the moment things were valued that could be measured and the intangible things that could not. So effectively, what they did, and as a socialist looking at this, it was absurd. It was, it, it was just a, a paradigm of absurdity. They took the Soviet planning system with indicative prices, the Goss plan, and they implanted it into universities. They did not implant it in the private sector. They implanted it in the pu public sector. So they took the Soviet planning model and put yeah. it in our schools and our systems uh, with the result that now we have universities that look sparkling and fantastic and they have all sorts of all singing, all dancing things. 
but the quality of, of, of education in this country has gone down the drain. And I can say that because I'm not a British politician, but I'm somebody who actually studied in, in Britain, in British universities and schools, and taught here, and I, I just wouldn't send my child but to a British university But this absurd creation of an internal market in Britain, in local government, and in health meant that you had this... Um, notional value of X department, Y department, Z department, and so on. Uh, and I, was a, I remember I was a member of a health authority in the 1980s when this internal market came in. It was utterly absurd, the whole thing. And I said, why on earth are we buying and selling from each other in the same building when they're all employed by the NHS? And of course, I knew the answer to that question perfectly well. The whole idea was that uh, the pharmacy will be run by Virgin in the future. The ambulance will be run Indeed. by somebody else, and so Indeed. on and so on. It was the first stage. And it was setting was up a market in order to privatise. Yeah. And uh, whilst the principle of the National Health Service is certainly there, the degree of privatisation, and with it, reduction in working conditions and living standards, so you have an, a national pay bargaining system within the NHS, of course, it's there, but an awful lot of people are not a party to that because they're working for a contractor going into the service. Same with local government and other services as well. Which is why um, our policies are a combination of recreating the principle of a universal public service like the National Health Service, like the Education Service. Um, but it's also about ensuring that there's real opportunities for everybody. Hence the offer we put forward on um, student fees and the principle that education should be a right, not a privilege, and not a commodity to be bought and sold. So we will set up a national education service on the lines of the NHS. Absolutely, because, look, as an economist, you know what is interesting? Even the gurus of neoliberal economics recognize that the market fails when it comes to education and to health. Yeah. So th this, th this is, this is a, a very interesting paradox. The, it's like having the pope, who's an atheist, and the cardinals being believers. So the, you know, the gurus of, of, of conservative, vulgar, neoclassical, neoliberal economics would tell you that Jeremy Corbyn is right, that you cannot really run a, a, a proper a health or education service on the basis of a simulation of a market. But it's the, 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 those who are employed, whose salaries are directly connected with the bodies, or corporate bodies, that will benefit from the privatization that come up with the theoretical neoliberal um, exegesis of why privatization is a good thing. So you, you will have to do battle against them. And they are many also and very has, well paid. But it also has the effect of diminishing the working conditions and pay of those within the public sector as well, because they're always told you've got to compete against somebody else. I was listening to this amazing report from a prison this morning yeah. on B the BBC. It was astonishing. Uh, Let's well, move. the prison is an example. East Coast Main Line, which runs from uh, Edinburgh to London, has now collapsed twice in the private, in the private sector. Uh, Carillion, which was largely reliant on public sector, or partly reliant on public sector contracts, collapsed and people discovered actually there wasn't anything there. And of course, this is a universal story. Speaking of collapsed infrastructure, think of Genoa. The privatized motorway system in Italy, uh, belonging to one family, uh, that makes three billion euros uh, economic rent from it and not servicing the infrastructure with the result, the deaths that we had a few days ago. Allow me, well, since I spoke about Italy, uh, let's move on to an event in June 2016. An event that we tried to prevent. We campaigned on the same side, uh, what we at DiEM25 referred to in and against in the EU, against this EU. This was the line that John McDonnell and I were uh, peddling in, in Doncaster, in Leeds, where we went and, and campaigned. Uh, you were accused of being sophisticated by the media. Of being sophisticated? Yes. <laughs> they didn't put well, it in well, those that's terms. A, that's a new one. I've never heard that before. You had the official Remain campaign, which was infantilizing the British public with the Project Fear. And you had the official Leave campaign, which was infantilizing the British public with those uh, monstrous claims as to what Brexit would mean for the country, and the NHS and all that. And you had Jeremy Corbyn and some of us who were saying, the EU is a cartel of big business, 
It's a pretty awful set of institutions, but we're better off staying in and fighting to change it from within in association and collaboration with our comrades, progressives across Europe. That's a sophisticated argument. And you are being accused of not being fully behind the bureaucracy of Brussels, of Barnier, of Merkel, of uh, Hollande. Yeah. Um, how do you feel being accused of being sophisticated? It's a, it's a low blow. It really is. It's a low blow. But yeah, I cope. Uh, what we were arguing for was remain and reform. There are very strong social arguments for the EU. Very strong arguments on workers' rights directive, on Charter of Fundamental Rights, on its connection with the European Court of Human Rights, environmental protections, consumer protections. Absolutely very strong arguments for all of that. And I would never want to walk away from those. There are also... Um, criticisms of the EU on its competition policy. I want our mail system to be in public ownership. Uh, there is a competition directive and there's arguments around that. There are arguments around the um, competition element within some EU policies which I think have to be challenged. And so what I was saying was, one is remain in the EU, but we would be a force in the EU for reform of it. And that was the, the whole point I was making in the campaign. Um, I hadn't heard that I was being over-sophisticated, but I'm... That's what they meant. I'll, I'll reflect on that. Because, you know, you had people like Nick Clegg and Tony Blair and David Cameron who, who were just adopting the EU mantra as if it was uh, sacred. Mm -hmm. And then you had the, the Brexiteers who were saying that Satan had created the EU and it was satanic. Well, and so here the... we were in the middle saying, yeah. look, it's pretty bad, yeah. but we're better off staying in and fighting within it. But, I mean, That's a sophisticated position to have. Britain is not in the euro, obviously. Um, Thank goodness but for we that. Could, um, we saw the way in which the European Central Bank treated yourselves and uh, also the austerity that was um, imposed on Ireland, on Portugal and Spain. It's not just austerity. They committed a crime against the Irish people. They, the, the, the head of the Central Bank of Europe um, put a gun on the Irish Prime Minister's head and demanded that overnight the losses of private investors, mostly from Germany, should be transferred onto the books of the Irish state. Mm. And the Irish prime minister succumbed. Now, that, that's, that's, you know, robbery. Just daylight robbery. That's what they did. As far as we're... Uh, 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 you will allow me to make one part of I mean, see, I actually uh, uh, was... I challenged the whole Maastricht idea, which established the European Central Bank, because it was a central bank based on price stability, not on living standards, not on rights and sharing. It was entirely on price stability. It was a purely ideological construction, which nevertheless, besides being ideologically quite putrid, it was technically and financially ridiculously stupid. We created a central bank without a state yeah. to be the central bank of 19 governments without a central bank. Go figure. Uh, but having said that, now we are on the road to Brexit, mm -hmm. Article 50 process. Mm -hmm. We have a government that is completely in disarray. Uh, it's a dog's Brexit pro process from where I'm standing, which is Athens. Um, what are you going to do? Let's say that Theresa May collapses and you move into 10 Downing Street before March. We would um, obviously, obviously, <laughs> we would obviously take over the negotiations. We'd obviously look for um, a substantial transition period, and our fundamental position would be access to the European market, and we would have a, we would accept the regulatory alignment. We'd indeed go further than it, and I'd go further than the European Union on a lot of trade deals. But we would not be saying, look, hang on a minute. If you don't give us what we want, we're going to go off and do a private deal with Donald Trump, which will be about uh, deregulation. It will be about the diminishing of working conditions, which is happening in the United States, courtesy of Trump and his administration. And we will not be going into that sort of protectionist trade war that um, he's going into at the present time. So we'd be seriously negotiating with them. And um, we recognize that there's always going to have to be a very close relationship with Europe. After all, half our trade is with Europe, and so it's, you can't walk away from it. May I 
convey to you what our position as the Democracy in Europe movement is yeah. on this transition period, because I, I, there's, there's not a single word of what you said that I disagree with. But to, to tie down a little bit more, uh, our proposal would be that you go for a, as close an alignment as possible for a five-year period renewable. Mm. That would mean something like Norway Plus, uh, which would effectively respect the leave verdict mm. of the British voters, create a period during which not, nothing mu much changes except common agricultural policy and fisheries, and it gives the House of Commons breathing space during which to debate what kind of longer term arrangements you want, or the people of Britain want, between the European Union and the United Kingdom without the ticking clock, without the gun on your heads as parliamentarians, as a country. But in the meantime, we've got the urgency of it that unless they make some serious moves and serious agreement, then there are a whole lot of jobs all over the UK mainly in manufacturing industry, that are going to be seriously at risk. But Norway Plus preserves them, because nothing changes. Absol absolutely. No, you have uh, customs union, uh, single uh, market, for a five-year yeah. year, year period. Yeah. Yeah? No, I, take your I take your point on that, but unless they do something, then there's an urgent situation Jeremy, where you know, the, the supply the, chain disappears. When you say they, you mean whom? The Tory government. Oh, the Tory government. You heard the about Tory them, government yeah. will never do anything decent. They will bring a terrible deal back from Brussels. They will not have a parliamentary majority. And my fear is that you're going to end up with a no-deal uh, no like Brexit. That's, that's our fear, I suspect. Uh, and, and you better make sure that, that, that you storm in 10 which, Downing Street as in, quickly as possible well, to prevent that. I would, my preference would be that since they clearly are not capable of negotiating this, they resign and we have a general election so yeah, that exactly. we can have that, uh, no have second that choice before the people of this country. I am wholly opposed to the idea of a second referendum for a very simple reason. You need a binary choice. You can't have a binary choice anymore. You, uh, now you have four options on the table. One is a deal like Theresa May's. A second option is uh, a hard Brexit Boris, Boris, Boris Johnson style. A third one is end the Brexit process altogether. And a fourth one is a Norway kind of agreement. Uh, for that, you need a general election. But also judge what you do by the effect you can have on people's lives. What can, what can we do about the levels of poverty in Britain? What would you do about the levels of inequality? Indeed. What do we do about the way uh, the housing crisis and so much else in this country? Do you have a government that's serious about doing that or do you, or do you not? That has to be the judge of what a government does. And I think that the great success of your manifesto mm. in the last general election was that you managed to shift the, the, foc the focus of the debate back on that, on what matters for people, and to, uh, to effectively escape, at least for a while, for a few weeks during the election campaign, this uh, polarization between uh, uh, Brexiteers and, uh, and Remainers. And, and, and I would like to, again, to speak, speaking from the perspective of our movement, which is a pan-European movement, it's so crucial to unite progressives that are in favor of remain and in favor of leave. Mm. This toxicity has to end. And we can do this. So what do progressive people in Germany, in France, the USA, Greece, Spain, wherever, they're actually saying much the same thing. You cannot go on diminishing the role of the public service of the state without paying a price in poverty, inequality, and without paying a price with people's lives being wasted. And so surely it has to be the question of what the community as a whole does in provision of housing security, health security, education security, and invests in, uh, in our future, invests in the infrastructure you need, the technology you need, and the um, development of new manufacturing processes. We can't run the whole world just on service economy. Absolutely. But in order to bring together the progressives from Germany, from the United States, from Mexico, from Italy, from Greece, from Britain, we need to create a political infrastructure, a movement that actually yeah. does that, not simply inviting each other to have little chats and going to each other's conferences. But you see, the bankers are internationalists. Yeah. They are completely united. They have a bankers internationale. The fascists are increasingly united. Steve Bannon is in Europe organizing the neo-fascist international between Salvini, Orban, the Polish government, the Kurds government in Austria, 
Um, I'm sure he's operating here. He even had a meeting with Boris Johnson. I don't know why he did that, but anyway, he did. Um, we need a progressive international by which to counter them. And we need to create, we, we need to go beyond the Brexit debate. Because even if Brexit happens, even if hard Brexit happens, there is nothing stopping us if we are coordinated. To have, for instance, you're going, and I'm very pleased to see that in your, I was very pleased to read this in your manifesto, you're going to create a new public investment bank, a national yeah. investment bank. Well, there's nothing stopping your new national investment bank and the European investment bank collaborating, issuing bonds together in order to create a fund for large-scale investments in, in green transition technologies that would create good quality jobs, and the Bank of England on the one hand, and the European Central Bank on the other, also collaborating in order to, to be standing by in the financial markets to purchase those bonds to make sure that the interest rates and the cost of borrowing for the green transition new deal for, for Europe, indeed, for North America as well. The, the whole point behind the National Investment Bank is that we lever in other investment as well in order to improve infrastructure and deal with the massive inequalities across the UK between English regions, between Scotland and the rest, between Wales and the rest, Northern Ireland, uh, and so on. And uh, unless we do that, then what, what do we continue doing? That's right. Having badly paid people working on zero hours contracts and you have a sort of sport direct as the model of employment or do you have something very much better and very different and uh, I don't pretend any of this is going to be easy to do but I want our government, a Labour government, to be measured against the re reduction in poverty, measured against reductions in um, homelessness, measured in reductions in uh, the number of people dropping out of school, university, and so on, and about improving people's lives, improving the quality of our environment and the quality of our lives. At the moment, we have this claim that there's high levels of employment in Britain. The reality is there's been frozen wages for 10 years mm -hmm. and the quality of employment for many people is falling. I spent part of this afternoon talking to a group of people in Glasgow who are working in the hospitality sector on zero hours contracts and they have this absolute fear of the phone ringing they demanded to come in that day and they're ill the child's sick all the sort of stuff that happens to all of us every day means they can't go in they then get written out completely and they've lost even the chance of working on a zero hours contract that is inhuman absolutely. that means their whole life is dominated by waiting for the phone to ring. is the phone going to ring is it going to ring yeah. That's just wrong. And so that kind of employment practice has got to end. And we are absolutely determined to do it, which is why we would go further than a lot of European rules on employment rights. From day one, full rights at work. That'd be a good start. Absolutely. And at the same time as the zero hour, hour contract uh, Uberized environment that you just yeah. described, in this country, you have about 850 billion pounds sitting idly in the city of London, beating up asset prices and house prices in the south of England, and not doing anything, anything productive. Your yeah. na National Investment Bank would be able, especially if it's coordinated with similar public investment banks in Europe, to soak up that liquidity by issuing bonds and putting it directly into the creation of good quality jobs in the green transition end. And sector. good quality housing, because at the moment the housing investment, actually some of which goes into building luxury apartments in London and the South East that are sold off plan, are used as a cash machine for those that have bought them, and sometimes they're bought and sold before they're even built, bought and sold several times before they're built. In the meantime, uh, the housing waiting lists are at record level all over the rest of the country for council housing or housing association properties. And so there has to be a change to the regional imbalance in England as well as between the nations, and there has to be investment in secure housing. Insecure housing has a very bad effect on children particularly, a very bad effect on people's lives, and also it's very expensive. So people are paying more to live in insecurity. That can't be right. Absolutely. Could I invite you, before we open it up, and we will open it up very soon, before we do this, could I invite you to be a bit more ambitious? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> in what respect? You have a great burden on you 
to be the leader, not just of a progressive democratic socialist movement in the United Kingdom, but also beyond the limits of the United Kingdom. People out there, and you know that, in Europe, in America, in Latin America, are looking at you for inspiration and leadership beyond the shores of these, these islands. Would it not be important and quite marvelous, actually, to create that progressive international with Bernie Sanders, with the new president-elect in Mexico, with us in Europe, in order to put forward a hopeful message to the people of Britain, to the people of Europe, and so on, people of India, in South Africa, that we need an international New Deal. Because all the problems that you described regarding Britain, of poverty, uh, low investment in the things that, in the good quality jobs, uh, the private debt situation in the, United, in the United Kingdom. I was looking at data about private debt in this country. You have a massive private debt crisis. You don't have a public debt, debt crisis. You have a private debt crisis. Mm -hmm. When more than half of the families in this country, especially working class families, need credit cards in order to put food on the table. You have a serious private debt issue. All these are problems that we have in Greece, they have in Mexico, we have in Italy. And it's a bit like climate change. You need to act upon them in this country, but it's not enough. To lift these boats, to empower the working class in Britain, mm. to have investment in good quality jobs, it would help to do the same thing in Europe, in the United States. This is why we need to coordinate. Yeah. And this is why we need people like Jeremy Corbyn to show leadership beyond the shores of this country. But we don't frame it around the individual, frame it around what we as, but you as people can do. I don't have do. the Labour Party here with me, I have you. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it is important, and you're right, that we build that sense of international connection, because you're quite right, others are very internationally connected in a better way than um, many of us are. I have spent a lot of time uh, talking to a lot of people across Europe over the past three years. Um, we are in touch with uh, Bernie Sanders and his campaign, and um, I'm delighted to say that um, the new president of Mexico, who I know, is, I consider him a friend, has invited me to his inauguration, and he has this massive opportunity, having won historically a big majority in the presidential election, to actually uh, challenge the levels of inequality in his country, which are probably the, the most unequal in the society in the world. Yeah. I mean, I know it's a tough competition, but I should imagine they're somewhere, yes. somewhere well up there at the top. And so, it's, you simply oh, Greece say... Oh, is doing pretty well yeah. in that competition. <laughs> One Come, of the few things we're good at. Coming, coming up on the rails, though. Uh, so there is uh, the whole movement of people saying, well, actually, I don't want to be worse off than my parents' generation. I don't want my children to be worse off. And I don't want the insecurity of knowing that somewhere or other, if I get ill, I've got to find the money to pay for a hospital treatment. Talk to anybody in the United States of what it's like to get ill, right. unless they've got some incredibly fortuitous private insurance system. They're absolutely terrified yes, of the they, bill they're going to get. It means and the bankruptcy. burden on their families, the bankruptcies that follow, the poverty that follows, the foreclosures and yeah. all that that follow as a result of it. People got to understand just what an achievement setting up our National Health Service was and the principles surrounding our welfare state. They're all under attack. This is why the moment Greece went bankrupt, the troika of creditors, the first thing they attacked was the, our National Health Service, yeah. which was never as good as yours, but they, they looked at it as um, a target that had to be brought down symbolically with menace and with uh, uh, ferocity. Uh, isn't there a constant philosophical debate between the individual and the collective? We want people to be individual, we want people to be imaginative, we want people to be excited for themselves and what they can achieve. But sometimes that goes so far that you forget that you actually do need your community, your society, the collective around you. It's the collective that achieves things, it's the collective that delivers. And that, well, you're talking to a Greek, it. and um, th th this... Well, the, you started all this democracy business, didn't you? Yeah, and it's actually not <laughs> just it was a very democracy business. Though it was a very flawed it democracy. It was the definition of the, the autonomous individual, which mm. is so profoundly different between the ancient Athenians and the, the British establishment. The British establishment has this view of the autonomous individual as uh, the lord in the manor house with very well-fortified fences. 
So the individual is well-defined, and it's well-defined in juxtaposition to everybody else, to the other, to the community. Yeah. The, the rest are seen as a threat to individual liberty in this country. Whereas in ancient Athens, uh, all the philosophers, the, the, the aristocrats, the democrats, the, the left wing, the right wing, they agreed on one thing, that the only way of becoming, of realizing your potential as an indi autonomous individual is through dialogue with mm. someone, by catching your reflection in the eyes of the other. So this, yes, so you're, you, you're well, knocking although there was on a, an open door There here. was a bit of a problem with Greek democracy. And yeah, they were, it relied on other people, namely slaves, to do a lot of work. And there there were, was a bit and, of a problem And women were not considered citizens, and the... And, and also, migrants didn't have the right right. to vote. Migrants, but, migrants and slaves didn't have the rights, and women had no rights at all. Uh, so the slaves were not human. Considered, mm. They were not considered even to be human. They were considered to be things, objects. The women were human but had no rights. And the metics, the migrants, were simply, you know, the riffraff. Um, the, the way that UKIP but, looks at people like... But they did all the work. <laughs> And of course, uh, the slaves did all the work. Slaves and the migrants, yeah. yeah. But what, what is also interesting, however, is that nevertheless, despite all these uh, uh, demerits of Athenian democracy, mm. it was the first time, and probably the last, where the majority who were the poor controlled the government. That's true, and there were also differences in democratic centres around Greece, wasn't it? It wasn't all of a single type. There wasn't there was sort only of central... One democracy, really. Well, there was Athens, but Athens. there was also other towns and other cities that did things a bit differently. Yeah, like Sparta, which was a, 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 a despotism yeah. beyond belief. But let's but open others, it up. Others were not all despotic. <laughs> <laughs> let's open it up. But you know what the interesting thing is? The Spartans, who were almost fascistic, nevertheless, they were feminist. Women had the right to a number of activities that they never did in Athens. But anyway, look, I've never heard anything so nice about the Spartans before. Well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Okay, so let's take some questions. Um, let's have um, the lady up there, yeah, and the gentleman down here in the glasses. Let's begin with these two questions. Hello. Um, so I'm a young person, and. Um, I feel like I've been interested in politics since I was 17, but a lot of time, um, some, not all, uh, some older people tend to look down on young people for their political views because it's not always fully formed or fully involved, uh, informed, I mean. And because we're at the book festival, I'm wondering if there's any recommended reading you would give uh, young people to inform their politics, seeing as no one really wants to educate us anymore. The gentleman here. Thanks a lot. Uh, we seem to have the most inept and incompetent government in Westminster probably in our lifetimes. My question is, why is Labour not streets ahead in the polls? Because you bloody well should be. OK, um, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, young people are intrinsically interested in their own lives and their own future. And I think that access to social media, notwithstanding all the unkind things we've just said about Google and Facebook, do give people an incredible opportunity to relate to each other, to discuss things with each other, and actually to explore ideas and things in a way that uh, they never would have done before. And I think social media is an amazingly strong form of communication. And it is very much uh, communication by young people um, with, uh, with each other. And uh, newspaper readership is declining very rapidly, and it's much more older people that, um, that buy and read newspapers. And I think that's an important factor in all this. But it's, it's also young people growing up in a sense of insecurity as well. The levels of mental health stress, the housing stress, the education stress, the job stress is massive amongst a lot of young people. They don't have the sense of security that other generations did. I mean, I personally didn't go to university. I'm not claiming any great hardship, but that, that was my choice. But had I wanted to and chosen to and gained entry somewhere, it would have been free for me. I would have got a grant, no fees. 
it would have been there, and there was that sense of security which um, young people don't have at uh, the moment. And so, a lot of what we were saying was about really trying to create a stronger sense of security for young people and also unleashing that imagination that's there. Young people are interested in politics. Politics wasn't interested in young people for a very long time. That surely has to be the key to it. On, on your point about the incompetence of the government, well, yes, they are incompetent, but they're also wrong. Wrong in what they're doing and wrong in the direction they're doing. We, as a party, obviously... Um, have a different approach, a completely different approach, and the manifesto we put forward was a, and is a transformational agenda for this country, and we have done well, but not well enough. We didn't quite win the general election, but we had a, a big increase in the Labour vote from previous elections, indeed the highest Labour vote for a, a very long time. And indeed, the future for socialist, social democratic and left parties across Europe is the message is very obvious. Where they go along with austerity, go along with a managerial approach of deflating or diminishing the role of the state, then they lose support and lose support in a very big way. Uh, I'm not complacent about this. We've got to do much better. We've got to do as much campaigning as we possibly can. And we also have to have a policy development process which we're developing, which does involve a very large number of people putting their views forward on all the issues that we put forward. But I tell you this, um, when the general election was called last year, we were written off by just about everybody. We mounted a campaign for the many, not the few, went out there, and took that message out there. And once the broadcasting rules kicked in, the public as a whole were able on broadcast media to hear at least what we were saying in the, gen in the general principles of that election campaign. And the result was what it was. I don't think this government can last that long. We will push them all the way we can. And we're absolutely ready for an election whenever we can get one. And we're determined to do it. And above all, we're absolutely determined to win it as well so that we do transform this society. So, uh, we are going to have this gentleman here because he's really outstretched his arm <laughs> to an extent that is medically problematic. Uh, and we want a lady. Yes, up there. You. Uh, but before you start speaking, until the microphone comes to you, the beauty of being a foreigner is that I can speak the truth without any repercussions. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, just before the general election, suffered a second coup d'etat within his own party. And to have brought home the Labour Party with a 40% vote is a majestic performance. It is a performance that needs to be applauded as a major triumph. OK. Right, uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, is that next month, uh, on the 11th of September, marks the 45th anniversary of the coup d'etat in Chile. What do you, as a trained economist, and what do you, as a democratic socialist, learn from that coup d'etat, and how does it inform the way that you both work today? And the lead. Uh, as an incoming prime minister faced with competing demands for expenditure and for investment, how would you assess the expenditure and investment needs of the social care sector? Okay. Well, that's um, on the first question um, about Chile, I feel very personally about Chile and very personally involved in Chile. I first went there in 1969 and I took part in the May Day March in Santiago that year, which was the first um, coming together of popular unity um, around Salvador Allende, who was the candidate for president. And a, a year later, um, he was elected president on about 34, 35% of the vote, I think, something like that. It's a first-past-the-post three-way election campaign. And his government w took office and was, from day one, undermined by the United States and was isolated and uh, a crisis of shortages and many other things was created. And uh, the military were incredibly strong. Um, 
always had been. They're very strong within Chilean society. And eventually, the coup happened, although it was eminently predictable, organized by Kissinger and, and the CIA. And it was brutal. 7,000 people disappeared. And uh, the brutality of it is kind of legendary. I'll give you just one example. The great musician Victor Hara, who could sing for the people, as he did, fantastic tunes, fantastic musician. He was one of those corralled into the national stadium. And to stop him playing his guitar and singing, they smashed his hands with a hammer so he couldn't play his guitar, and he could, but he continued singing even with that. And that was the bravery of the people. The coup happened because of a powerful military, because of the sponsorship of what they're doing by the US at the, at the time. And it also happened because the rest of the world didn't realize quite how perilous the journey was that um, Allende and the socialists were undertaking in Chile. They built houses, they reduced poverty, they brought mining and other industries into public ownership, and the living standards of the poorest people improved a great deal. It was seen as a threat to the wealthy in Chile and to the big corporations who were frightened of a process of public ownership of their mines, copper mines particularly. And so the lessons are that you can't do it on your own. The lessons are there has to be international solidarity with people when they're going through um, the kind of transformation that Chile went through. Um, I got involved in wanting Pinochet prosecuted and indeed, I went back to Chile um, during 1990 when the Pinochet regime finally finished. And um, it was an achievement of the people of Chile. They finally did get rid of that military dictatorship. And I spoke at a rally at Villa Grimaldi, which had been the torture center of the Chilean fascist regime, with Michel Bachelet, who later became the president. And so there was a process of... Um, coming together, there was a process of prosecution of those people that um, committed those appalling crimes. But the point is, we should have a basis, and this is where I conclude at this point, basis in our foreign policy, which is about human rights, which is about respect for democracy, which is about environmental sustainability, and so that we, we form our relationships with other countries on the basis of how they respect their own people and how they respect international norms of human rights and, and, and law as a whole. And uh, I um, learned a great deal from the whole Chilean experience and I think we all need to learn a lot from it as well because governments that are trying to adopt a social justice pass will always be attacked by those that want to preserve their wealth, be it in tax havens or within their own society. On the second question that you asked about social care, the social care system across the UK is poor. The uh, numbers of people that are stuck in hospital because uh, social care is not available for them when they should be uh, discharged from hospital and go into a care supportive environment, they end up either staying in hospital, which doesn't do them any good and isn't any good for the hospital either, or they um, cannot get the social care they need. So somebody in the family has to give up work and care for often an older, a high dependency relative. And it's nearly always women who end up losing their jobs and their careers because of the failure of the social care system. I'm absolutely determined that we have a social care system worthy of the name that does ensure that all those who need social care get that social care and you don't impoverish the family on the, in the process of doing that. It is, it is expensive, but it's very important to actually do that. Because uh, if you, I'm sure you, some of you would have done, is read the um, original National Health Service Act of 1946. And it's, even now, it's an inspiring document to read. In the preamble, in the first paragraph, it talks about doctors, talks about hospitals, but it also talks about social care and mental health. It sees it as a comprehensive. And uh, Nye Bevan, who founded the NHS, was also the Minister of Housing, and he said, good housing leads to good health. 
You cannot have good health in a polluted environment, insecure, poor quality housing, low pay and poverty. Good health is a combination of clean air, clean water, sufficient food to eat, but also a sense of mental well-being, as well as obviously the medical needs you support. You need to support people who are going through an illness or a condition that needs medical help. But health is not a specific, it is a generality as well. I will take one more question from the lady here in the middle. I wait for the microphone. Um, while the microphone is coming to you, let me say that in 1967, we had our own fascist coup d'etat, and many Democrats from Greece were given uh, refuge in Chile by Allende. Yeah. And then in 1973, we, or 74, by the time democracy was restored in Greece, we returned the favor to many of them. So we, solidarity is important, but that does not hide the fact. Firstly, that in the end we failed to prevent the two coups. And secondly, the international oligarchy is now staging coups, not by means of the tanks, but by means of the banks, as it happened in Greece in July of 2015. I mean, there were indeed Spanish people that had escaped from Franco in Spain and went to Chile. And then um, Franco died shortly after the coup in Chile, and then they found themselves back in Spain, having spent 40 years in exile in Chile, only to find a Franco equivalent to take over in Chile. That's right. That's right. Okay, Lily. Uh, you both said very fine words that few people would argue with. Uh, how can we, you explain the increasing fear that Labour is not getting any nearer 10 Downing Street? Well, listen, Labour has got more members than we've ever had before. We're more active than we've ever been before. We have great hostility from the mainstream media than we probably ever had before. Um, I think we are in a strong position to keep people united around the agenda we put forward on social justice, transformation, challenging and ending inequality in Britain, and giving people hope bringing people together in hope of what can be achieved. What the right offer in our society is racism, they offer division, they offer something that is not very pleasant in society and will not actually solve any of the problems that people face. I think people have to have the confidence that we can deal with poverty, we can deal with unemployment, we can invest for the future, we can have a sustainable life for all of us and we can work together with others around the world who think the same. Our unity, our unity of purpose, of peoples all over the world, the United States, Europe, rest of the world, is something that I think is getting stronger. Don't be undermined by those that want to divide us. Unite together around the kind of world we could create. We had a sniff of that in the last general election. I wish to God we'd won the general election. I did everything personally I could to make sure we won that general election. But I tell you what, next time we're going to do it even bigger and even better. And what's more, we're going to win it, OK? Well, we're drawing to a close. I want to thank the Edinburgh uh, book Festival people for giving us the space to create uh, a dialogue uh, to have the best antidote possible to the toxic debates that take place in the airwaves, in the newspapers, in this highly polarized society, in this highly polarized Europe, in this highly polarized world. We need to stick together across European borders across international borders, across even political party divisions, because we have a unique opportunity not to uh, repeat the mistakes of our grandparents when after a major financial crisis, that generation, 2008, that took place in 1929, a nationalist international rose up, taking advantage of the establishment's inanity and authoritarianism, in order to drag the world into an abyss. We have an opportunity to stop this, and we are only going to do it through solidarity and rational debating. Thank you, Jeremy, Thank for you. being here. Thank you. Thank you all.
Thanks very much. We really enjoyed that.